This video is brought to you by Brilliant. Check out the link in the description for a free 30-day trial and 20% off an annual subscription. I don't know about you, but I feel like anytime I try to ask anybody about the music they listen to these days, I get some variation of the same answer. A little bit of everything. If most of your life has been spent in the post-streaming era, this probably doesn't seem like much of a surprise, but I can promise you that this is not how things have always been. There was a time not so long ago when people formed their entire identities around what genre of music they listened to. Admitting to liking music outside of your chosen genre meant that you were at risk of being ostracized or labeled as a sellout, and there were even once street fights between the followers of different musical subcultures. Nowadays that thought seems a little absurd. It's not that there aren't still people who only listen to one genre and detest anything else, there's still plenty of keyboard warriors going to battle over their chosen music. If you want proof, just look at my comment section anytime I praise any piece of pop music. But by and large, these folks are a dying breed. As the internet has given more and more people access to the breadth of human creation, these taste divides have begun to look more and more arbitrary. Slowly but surely, it's becoming evident that genre, that enormous pillar that has played such a huge role in defining modern music, is losing its relevance. And personally, I think it's about time. For basically as long as humans have been making art, we've been trying to categorize it. Aristotle wrote about genre all the way back in 335 BCE, in his work Poetics. That conception of genre is a lot stricter than our modern one, but it laid the groundwork for generations of trying to fit art into neat and tidy boxes. The only problem is that art doesn't really fit into neat and tidy boxes. This little speed bump has led to oceans worth of ink being spilt by academics trying to formalize definitions of what a genre is beyond, I don't know, vibes. One of the most important papers on the topic is Franco Fabri's A Theory of Musical Genres, Two Applications. That paper defines genre as a set of musical events, real or possible, whose course is governed by a definite set of socially accepted rules. If that sounds a little broad and convoluted to you, that's only because it is. The rest of his paper spends a lot of time trying to define what exactly counts as socially accepted rules, noting formal and technical rules, semiotic rules, behavior rules, ideological rules, and economic rules. It's an interesting paper if you've got the stomach for this sort of academic language, but I don't really. I have no delusions about the fact that I am not an academic, so if you want to dive more into this, ask 12tone or something. The point that I'm trying to get across here is that formalizing any sort of definition of genre is hard. Everyone's got a broad idea of what a genre is in their mind, but when we get into the nitty gritty and try to come up with strict definitions, things can sort of fall apart. Hell, things even fall apart when we try to define a single genre. Take jazz, one of the oldest and most beloved musics. People use jazz to describe everything from Frank Sinatra's smooth takes on the Great American Songbook to Ornette Coleman's Beautiful Chaos to Robert Glasper's rich, funk, and hip-hop-infused jams. The same could be said about rock. I personally find it kind of ridiculous to say that the raw energy of Blitzkrieg Bop is in any way part of the same genre as the elaborate experiments of Dance of the Moonlit Night or the broad stadium sounds of Radioactive. And that's without even getting into things like world music, which is an absurd lumping together of things that share almost nothing in common, or classical, a phrase that people use to describe literal centuries of music. Again, 12tone has a great video on that if you want to get into more depth. Hi Corey. Sorry for calling you out. Look, I know that I'm cherry picking examples here. Genre is definitely not completely arbitrary. As diverse as Blitzkrieg Bop and Moonlit Night are, they do both feature similar collections of instruments, and they do both trace their roots to the same origins. Of course, country music also features many of the same instruments and traces its roots to the exact same origins. And that gets us to one of my biggest problems with genre as we conceptualize it today. You see, many of the main genres that we categorize music with today date back a century to a divide that was pretty arbitrary and built on racial lines. In the 1920s, the recording industry was entering its first boom. Recording technology had become cheap enough in America that it was accessible to customers across all economic classes. For the first time, a market started to develop for music by black artists intended for black audiences. 
But America was still a fully segregated nation, and that segregation carried through to the music industry. So record companies began to market music by black artists as race records. These records would eventually prove to be hits across racial lines, and many of the best-selling records of the era were race records, launching a generation of black performers into stardom. I'm not going to pretend that there's no cultural difference between black and white musicians of the day, but the difference was not so drastic that it warranted sectioning off black musicians entirely. This is especially true when it came to poor white musicians, who often shared a lot more in common with the black musicians of the day. The best example of this might be Jimmy Rogers, the man who is now called the father of country music. The hit that launched Rogers into stardom was Blue Yodel No. 1, T for Texas, a 12-bar blues based on songs that Rogers had picked up from rail workers and vaudeville shows. The only difference between T for Texas and many of the black blues songs being recorded at the time was Rogers' patented yodel, pulled from Appalachian folk music. But even that wasn't unique. Tommy Johnson did very similar yodeling in his own blues music. Nevertheless, Rogers' music was placed on a different shelf than Johnson's. And what spun off from that separation was the genre that would eventually be called country music. Today we can look at country, jazz, and blues as very different things, but back then, Louis Armstrong, the jazz legend, recorded a song with Jimmy Rogers. Segregation explicitly changed the paths of these musics, and many of them carry that legacy to this day. Just look at the response to Lil Nas X's Old Town Road and Beyonce's take on country, Cowboy Carter. The legacy of racial divides in genre can be felt beyond country too. At the 2020 Grammys, Tyler the Creator's Igor won Best Rap Album, despite clearly being a pop album. Tyler himself called that a backhanded compliment, saying that the Grammy Awards' urban categories were a politically correct way of saying the N-word. It's not that all genre is evil or entirely useless, but it's really hard to divorce that racial history from genre as we understand it now. The modern iteration of the musical genre is a construction of the music industry. At its core, it exists to make it easier for people to buy records that they like. The industry wants people to be divided up so they can sell identities to them, and often this can mean turning those identities against each other. When two subcultures are supposedly going to war, record sales for both will go up. To be clear, genre is not entirely a bad thing. In the days when physical media reigned supreme, it was pretty useful to have easy categorizations, even if they could be arbitrary and problematic in their origins. If you were going to spend your hard-earned money on a record you'd never heard, you wanted a good sense as to whether you'd like it or not. And if you were a musician, it was beneficial to be able to describe your sound to people, or to find like minds and form a scene. Genre ties were the core of all sorts of scenes that united to create fantastic music and even drive social change. As a piece of social technology, it's possible that genre has done as much good as harm. I know that in my life, genre was one of the main ways that I conceptualized music and understood my own tastes for a long time. But I think that social technology is becoming obsolete. Between the 1920s and 1990s, we easily had a dozen different distinct genres emerge. But last time we've had a truly novel new genre come about, at least in the mainstream, was probably EDM. And that happened anywhere from 25 to 40 or even 50 years ago, depending on how you want to define things. I guess if you really wanted, you could call hyperpop the newest genre, but I don't think that it'll ever reach the sort of widespread penetration and adoption that the latest wave of genres like hip-hop and EDM did. Please feel free to dunk on me if and when I'm proven wrong on this one, though. What we have today, instead of new genres, is a parade of increasingly fractionalized subgenres and microgenres. Movements that often have no central cohesion, or movements with very little room to grow in their aesthetic. Things like chill wave or nightcore, pirate metal, country gaze, or squee. As far as I'm concerned, a lot of these are really stretching any sane definition of genre. Half of them are little more than a meme, and the rest are incredibly narrow descriptors. There's definitely a temptation to go all old man yells at cloud here and say this is why music was better back in the day, but I just don't believe that. I don't have a problem with any of these musics. I think it's absolutely amazing that we live in a world where people have the technology and access to mash up bizarre cultural influences and create these hyper-specific kinds of music. I just think that 
in this world, the bounds of genre are fast dissolving to the point that there's very little value in relying on them at all. Genres are a relic from an age of monocultures, an age when people divided themselves fiercely along aesthetic lines because that was the best way of making sense of the world and of their place within it. But the internet is ending that. All these one-time subgenres are constantly mixing. They're smashing into each other and cross-pollinating into a single, enormous polyculture. And that fucking rules. It's absolutely amazing that I live in a world where I can go listen to metal with Mongolian throat singing, or Alvin and the Chipmunks slow down into the heaviest sludge you've ever heard. Why would you possibly define yourself by one or two genres when you have basically the entirety of recorded music available to you at the click of a button. I think that's why people don't really know what to answer when you ask them what kind of music they listen to. There's just too much out there, and it's too easy to listen to all of it. Genre's obsolescence stretches beyond this self-identification too. It used to be a useful means of finding new music, and it definitely still can be, but these days, far more people are finding new music without searching, thanks to the increasing dominance of recommendation algorithms. I'm very much on the record as not being the biggest fan of recommendation algorithms, but the fact of the matter is that they're here to stay. And these algorithms target people's tastes in ways far more direct and specific than the broad abstraction of genre ever could. Just look at Spotify's niche mixes, which sometimes base themselves around genre, but are increasingly targeting things like emotions, vibes, or even times of day. For all the issues that I have with Spotify, I do tend to think that's more true to how I listen to music than any genre classification ever has been. When I personally build playlists, and when I decide what to listen to, Genre is a pretty minor consideration. Hell, my record collection isn't even organized by genre, or, or even by the alphabet. It's organized by vibes. I'm a lot more concerned about the emotional space that music puts me in, and that's something that transcends any model of genre I've ever seen. And when you expand your vision beyond genre, you start to make new connections that you never saw there before. A couple years back, I pissed off a fair number of people by saying that Fishman's long season reminded me of Imperial-era Pink Floyd. But honestly, that's a statement I still stand by. Sure, they come from drastically different genre traditions, but long season and echoes are both dreamy, drawn-out pieces soaked in reverb. Both are based heavily around slow builds of melodic guitar melody paired with syncopated bass grooves, and both even have a breakdown in the middle based on abstract, experimental sound palettes. Or how about Ziggy Stardust and Mothership Connection, two cosmic albums rooted in the blues that tell the story of intergalactically transcendent music? I've got playlists that put obscure Estonian folk music next to Lorena McKennett and the soundtrack to Lord of the Rings because they all give me a similar fey sort of vibe. And I don't think I'm particularly unique in this. I think this is how a lot of people listen to music these days. I don't think my categorizations are perfect and infallible, but I also don't think that they're much more arbitrary than a lot of genre categorizations. You don't need to agree with them, and in fact I'm happy if you don't. Just please don't disagree solely on the bounds of genre, because frankly, there's a lot more out there than that. I don't think genre is ever truly going to die out entirely. Despite all this, it's still got its uses, and it's been woven so deeply into our culture that some people are always going to think in those terms. But I think its power and influence is fast waning. And personally, I'm ready for a world where we can find more interesting ways of defining music. I've always been a bit of a fiend for knowledge, whether that's within the musical world or without. And that's why I'm stoked to tell you about this week's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a site with thousands of lessons in all sorts of STEM topics, from math to data analysis to programming and AI. It's a place where you can learn by doing thanks to their beautiful interactive lessons. All these lessons are built with a hands-on approach in mind, crafted by an award-winning team of teachers and researchers. If you're looking for a place to start, you could check out How LLMs Work, which teaches you the ins and outs of AI language models. In that course, you'll be able to get your hands dirty with real language models, understand the importance of training data, and learn how to fine-tune your language to help these models serve your purposes. You can love or hate AI, but the reality is that this technology is here to stay, so why not try to get a better understanding of how it works? Check it out for now, free of cost, by going to the link in the description. Following that link will get you 30 days free, and after that, you'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription. 
Following that link also does a ton to help support my channel. So thank you so much for your support and thank you all for watching.